Next, I'd like to invite up. Uh, next, I'd like to invite up Yuzi to talk a bit about the projects that the React Core team has been working on for the past year. Welcome, Yuzi. Hi everyone, my name is Yuzi, and I'm the engineering manager for the React Core team and the Relay team at Facebook. I'm really excited to be here and share some of the exciting projects the React Core team has been working on. So at the last React Conf, we left it off at Hooks. In February of this year, we officially released Hooks al along with developer tools and testing util updates as part of the 16.8 release. React Hooks allows developers to build reusable, stateful logic that can be shared between components. Hooks are designed for the future of React in, ways that, in a way that they naturally encourage code that is compatible with all of our upcoming features like accessibility, server-side rendering, suspense, and concurrent mode. And like many of our other features, Hooks are incrementally adoptable. That means ho code using Hooks works side by side with the existing code. Since the release, adoption of, uh, reception of Hooks has been really positive. At Facebook, we saw a lot of engineers eager to adopt Hooks in their products. We also worked on bringing React Hooks to Relay and have seen our product code dramatically simplified. I think what's more exciting is seeing Hooks everywhere. I was pretty shocked when I searched React Hooks on GitHub and saw over 9,000 repository results. So with that quick recap of Hooks, let's talk about some of the longer term projects the team has been tackling. One of the areas we're exploring is, assess is accessibility. Great applications are inclusive in that anyone should be able to use them. Accessibility features are not just for a small group of people, but really for everyone. We all run into times and situations when accessibility features can improve our user experience. And we want to make it easier to build those accessible experiences in React. Currently, React supports building accessible websites, often by using standard HTML techniques. The thing is, it isn't really perfect. In many cases, it needs a little bit of nudge in the direct, right direction to do the right things. This is often because the DOM structure is being modified based on product logic in a way that the default HTML patterns don't always apply. And this could sometimes lead to keyboard focus being lost or set on an unexpected component. Effects will require accessing the underlying DOM elements. We want to make it easier to do the right thing and build these experiences directly in React without having to rely on escape hatches to access the DOM on web and eventually native components on React Native. To help with that, there's two areas that we've been looking into. The first one is managing focus. Getting focus to work correctly is critical because it's a fundamental part of how keyboard control works. And it's also critical for working well with screen readers. The challenge right now is with features like React portals and suspense fallback. What's rendered in the view elements doesn't always match the semantics of how React trees are organized. We need to provide good primitives that allow a more structured way of making sure component flows work well for those cases and are accessible by default. The other area we're looking into is better support for different input devices. When React was created seven years ago, it was initially designed with the web in mind, where a vast majority of the users interact with the page by using a mouse. Since then, the commonly used input devices, the number of commonly used input devices have expanded. We have stylus pens and also touch interfaces. In VR, we even have Oculus Touch. Yet many APIs still assume a standard mouse input. Pointer events were created to be more device agnostic and work for a variety of pointing hardware. They provide a single set of events to make it easier to build for applications that work well across different surfaces. As pointer events become more available across browsers, there needs to be, uh, there's a need to expose a higher level APIs to make application work more seamlessly, no matter what device it's being loaded on. With better APIs around focus and pointer events, we'll be able to build support for rich gestures that work across platform and are accessible by default. So this year, we've been looking into extending primitives to make these happen. And we're still in the early stages of research for this. 
Another thing we're looking into at making it easier is to improve the initial render time. People with slower machines get a worse experience when they use a fully client rendered site. Based on our observations, people on slower computers could see an initial render that takes three times longer than on faster machines. We noticed that all parts of the initial load are significantly slower. This includes the time it takes to download the resource from the network. Even sending the initial request from the client can have a delay. In order to make content show up as quickly as possible, we want to minimize the amount of CPU we use on the client for initial render, especially on slower devices. Server rendering allows us to do some of this heavy lifting on the server and deliver markup to the client. The idea of server rendering isn't new, and what already exists has been serving the community well. However, there's limitations to what's out there. We're tackling those constraints by working on a built-in support for server-side rendering that has several features. First is that it works with lazily loaded components to reduce the bytes needed on the client. Next is support streaming down markup in chunks as they're ready for a faster initial paint. Last but not least, it's fully compatible with concurrent mode and suspense. Getting pixels on the screen is just the first step in creating an engaging user experience. In traditional React rend server rendering, we help the user see a snapshot of the page as quickly as possible. But the screen is frozen while React synchronously hydrates everything. In other words, React booting up the JavaScript views on the client so that they can reuse the server render components and make them interactive. In the worst case, some devices for complex pages, this could take several, CPU, several seconds of CPU time. And this could cause the site to feel sluggish despite having a faster render time. One improvement of this is borrowing the streaming idea from server rendering to hydrate the page, where we hydrate different parts of the page in chunks. With this model, you could server render just one part of the page, stream the markup to this client, hydrate just that page before continuing with rendering the rest of the page. And this helps minimize the amount of time that non-interactive content is being shown. Having interactive content display on the page is great, but it doesn't really matter if that's not the part of the page the user was planning on interacting with. What if we can take this one step further by prioritizing the parts of the page that the user is actually going to interact with? Since the user tend to hover with a mouse or focus on an element with their keyboard before clicking, prioritizing those components give us time to start hydration before the user interacts. We call this selective hydration, where React will pause whatever work it's doing in order to prioritize the components that the user is actually interacting with. This ability to respond quickly to user interactions make it less urgent to hydrate the entire page. So let me show you what this looks like in practice. Each of these boxes represent a component that still needs to be hydrated. The darker something is, the further it is from being interactive. As I hover over my contacts and other components on the page, those gets priority and gets hydrated first. Now, why is selective hydration important? As we build and iterate on products, the complexity of the product and the number of components we have tends to grow. Even if we speed up the framework significantly, there will still be just as many components and associated product logic on the page. As the complexity of the product grows even more, most performance improvements can't prevent the CPU time from growing at the same rate. I'm not saying that we should stop trying to improve the frameworks and make them perform more performant. We still need to do that. We should also look for ways to change the equation of that growth curve. Selective hydration allows us to be smarter about what work actually needs to be done first and prioritize just that fraction of work even though it doesn't really reduce the overall amount of work that needs to be done, it does decrease what's needed on the critical path of responding to a user interaction. And with that, we can completely change the equation of how long users have to wait. Instead of looking at a time that's proportional to the overall complexity of all the, all the components on the page, it ends up being just the complexity of the components that user interacts with. We think that selective hydration can deliver a noticeable improvement to the end user. 
And what's really cool is that this is something we've already shipped to actual users at Facebook. It doesn't matter how fast a page loads if it feels janky and slow. How fast a page feels to the user is what we call perceived performance. It's often just as important as absolute performance. And it can be difficult to deliver good perceived performance on an app. On one hand, it might not be feasible to load the entire application at once. On the other hand, manual methods of coordinating and loading a bunch of things asynchronously it can be incredibly air prone and can lead to low quality experiences. There's a lot of things that we want to avoid, such as waterfalls of loading states that initiates another set of loading states. We want to avoid having multiple loading spinners on the page at the same time. And also we want to avoid layouts that are constantly flickering or getting shifted as content loads. Suspense is the React system for orchestrating the loading of code, data, and images. And the goal is to make it easier to break up an application and provide better loading states that offer higher quality user experience. So I know this is not the first time many of you have heard of suspense. So you might be asking, why is it taking so long? Well, it is called suspense. <laughs> <laughs> but su the suspense is almost over. So it's been taking a while because we wanted to make sure we're using the right heuristics and have the right set of defaults um, to provide a great out-of-the-box experience. We've been experimenting, testing, iterating on it, and with real use cases to ensure that we can help engineers deliver a great user experience. And we don't always get things right the first time for various product use cases. And sometimes we hit a wall and have to rethink our approach. As we work through different product use cases, we make progress towards understanding the space and get closer to an approach that will work well. So they say a picture is worth a thousand words, so let's see some suspending images. I'm going to leave the explanation of code and data loading with suspense for Ashley and Joe to cover later in the conference. So in this demo, we're rendering photos of the conference speakers in our grid. Please note that these videos are recorded with net network speed intentionally slowed down so that we can see all the loading states. This first one is how web currently works by default. So let's load it up. OK, so what do you guys think? Not too bad, right? But there was a lot of flickering as the images gets downloaded and rendered, and sometimes they're doing that one at a time. With suspense, we can ho hold off on some of the updates until more of the images are ready. In this version, it's a bit better with fewer loading states. But now I'm noticing that there are some gaps in between the images when a later image is rendered before an earlier one. So we can do better than this. In this version, we're letting suspense coordinate the items in a list, and we can make sure they only show up in order. Well, we probably don't want to do this with this set of images, but if we know there are a small number of photos of we're loading a bunch of small icons on a page, we might also want to wait to show all of them at once. And just for fun, why not do it backwards? Even with user interface that's as simple as a list of photos, Suspense can completely transform the loading experience. And the best part is you can drop it in and wrap existing components in Suspense, and it would just work. Techniques like selective hydration and the full set of Suspense features are made possible by concurrent mode. Concurrent mode enables React apps to be more responsive by giving React the ability to interrupt large blocks of lower priority work in order to focus on something that's higher priority, like responding to a user input. As Tom said, we need to be able to parallelize and reprioritize work as much as possible. In single threaded environments like web, we, have to, we can have all the work go th run through a scheduler, and React will render React rendering will yield frequently to check if there's any prior priority work that needs to happen to ensure that the UI can stay responsive. In a multi-threaded environment like React Native, you can actually interrupt work happening in the JavaScript thread on a, a JavaScript in a background thread when a synchronous message is passed in from the main thread. For example, when the user swipes to go back. By having concurrent node be part of React, we have the benefit of letting the framework take over to coordinate the flow and priorities of the different types of work. 
When everything on the client is using React, it means we can even do things like warming up components and pre-rendering components that might be needed later without, having, without worrying that it will block any high priority work. Developers will get that benefit without needing to write extra logic to do so manually. So we've been testing concurrent mode internally on the new Facebook.com. While the APIs are not finalized yet, concurrent mode, along with all the features it brings, have been working well for us. It's helped improve both absolute performance and the responsiveness of the initial load, and also the perceived performance of the website. Concurrent mode is now available in our experimental channel. It includes all of our concurrent features, and we also have a new section of the doc that describes these features and how they work. Our goal is to enable sharing of knowledge and cross-pollinate ideas before the APIs are finalized. We would love for you to try it out, give us feedback, help us identify edge cases, bugs, and refine the APIs. So this is only a subset of the project the core team has been working on. Tomorrow morning, Brian's going to be talking about some of the exciting new developer tooling features like fast refresh and the new dev tools. <laughs> and right after Brian, Joe will be covering relay hooks and how we're using suspense with data fetching in more detail. Thank you, and I hope you all have a great time at ReactConf. <laughs>